Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Tuesday, July 21st. Today is the day we commemorate the prophet Ezekiel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of the glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to gather... God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the days past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all his praise? Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them, that I may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Our New Testament reading today is a continuation of our reading from the book of Acts. And when they had inflicted many blows upon Paul and Silas, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and vis visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. And you might be asking yourself, well, how did they know they're Roman citizens? When you were a citizen of the Roman Empire, you wore a ring made of iron, pure iron. Uh, and only a Roman citizen could wear that kind of ring. So they would instantly see that and know, well, okay, these men are actually Roman citizens. It would be unmistakable. Uh, in case you were curious, uh, how could they could tell. Ezekiel, the son of Buzi, was a priest called by God to be a prophet to the exiles during the Babylonian captivity. In 597 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army brought the king of Judah and thousands of the best citizens of Jerusalem, including Ezekiel, to Babylon. Ezekiel's priestly background profoundly stamped his prophecy, as the holiness of God and the temple figure prominently in his messages. From 593 B.C. to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 586, Ezekiel prophesied the inevitability of divine judgment on Jerusalem 
on the exiles in Babylon, and on seven nations that surrounded Israel. Jerusalem would fall and the exiles would not quickly return as a just consequence of their sin. Once word reached Ezekiel that Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, his message became one of comfort and hope. Through him, God promised that his people would experience future restoration, renewal, and revival in the coming Messianic kingdom. Much of the strange symbolism of Ezekiel's prophecies was later employed in the revelation to St. John. And tonight we begin our reading of the Augsburg Confession. We're first going to uh, begin with some historical background and uh, some uh, background information. So the presentation of the Augsburg Confession we observe on June 25th, 1530. And on that day, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Dr. Christian Beyer stood and walked toward the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V and began reading the Augsburg Confession in a loud and distinct voice. Through the open windows, a hushed crowd outside in the courtyard hung on his every word, as did the two hundred or so people gathered in the hall. Beside Dr. Baer stood Dr. Gregory Bruck, holding a copy of the Augsburg Confession in Latin. The German princes around him stood up to indicate their support for the confession. The emperor motioned for them to sit down. When Dr. Baer finished reading, Dr. Brook took the German copy of the Confession from him, handed both copies to the Emperor, and said, Most gracious Emperor, this is a confession that will even prevail against the gates of hell, with the grace and help of God. Thus was the Augsburg Confession presented as a unique confession of the truth of God's holy word, distinct from Romanism on the one hand, and the Reformed Anabaptist and Radicals on the other. June 25th, 1530 is a date every bit as important for Lutherans as the more familiar date of October 31st, 1517, the day on which Luther posted his 95 Theses. The events leading up to Augsburg. Uh, since Os the presentation of the Augsburg Confession was a decisive moment, and it was a long time in coming, it's important to understand the history leading up to the imperial meeting at Augsburg. Nine years earlier, on April 18, 1521, at the imperial meeting in Worms, Charles had listened as Martin Luther refused to recant his teachings, saying, I cannot and will not recant, I cannot do otherwise, here I stand, God help me, amen. Now Charles was watching as the most important rulers in his German territories confessed their faith openly and courageously, in spite of the threats to their lives from both the government and the church. Martin Luther had been declared a criminal and a heretic. He was excommunicated and sentenced to death in April of 1521. By 1526, the Reformation had spread to the point that during an imperial meeting at Speyer, the Lutheran princes forced through a resolution that gave each of them the right to arrange religious matters in their respective territories in any way he felt was best, until the emperor was able to have the pope call a general council of the church which did not happen until the Council of Trent, by the way. So from 1526 to 1529, little changed in the Holy Roman Empire. As a result, most of northern Germany became Lutheran, along with many cities in southern Germany. At the Second Imperial Meeting in Spire in 1529, the princes loyal to Rome reversed the decision made three years earlier. The princes loyal to the Lutheran Reformation and the other reforming movements fiercely protested this decision, issuing a, for, a formal protestio. Thus the Lutherans, along with other reformers, were labeled Protestants. And that name has stuck ever since. Charles ordered all rulers within the empire to go to Augsburg to attend the imperial meeting, also known as a Reichstag or a Diet. He wanted to settle once and for all the controversies in the churches throughout his Germany. The armies of the Turkish Empire were literally at the eastern gates of Charles' empire. He wanted unity so that the Turkish threat could be met. And by Turks at that time, they mean, they mean Islam. Islam was knocking at the door of the eastern end of the Holy Roman Empire, as well as they occupied territories as far uh, west and north as Spain. So they were becoming surrounded uh, by Islam. Lutheranism was not only tolerated where it could not be eliminated by military force. 
Lutherans had no protection in German territories that were loyal to Rome. After the 1529 Diet of Spire, Philip of Hesse sought to create a political federation for the mutual defense of those who had protested the autocratic vision of Charles V. Philip of Hesse and Jakob Sturm united Saxony and Hesse with certain southern German evangelical cities, with Ulm, Strasbourg, and Nuremberg as the nucleus. The coalition was created on April 22, 1529, in a secret agreement at Spire. To clear the way for possible inclusion of the Swiss in the Federation, Philip of Hesse planned to settle the dispute between Luther and Ulrich Zwingli at a meeting at Philip's castle in Marburg. The Lutherans were concerned by Philip of Hesse's desire to put, away politi to put political unity ahead of doctrinal unity. After the Diet of Spire, Philip Melanchthon, who had kept silent regarding differences between the German Lutherans and the Swiss, he had a change of heart and tried to thwart the Federation. Luther also opposed a Federation without confessional unity. The Schwabach Articles were prepared by Luther and others sometime between July 25th and September 14th of that year. The Marburg Colloquy took place on October 2nd to the 4th of 1529. Ulrich Zwingli and Martin Luther faced each other across a table for most of the meeting. The two groups identified much that they agreed about, yet the talks broke down. The disagreement had to do with the Lord's Supper. Zwingli was willing to settle for an agreement-to-disagree approach, but Luther insisted that Jesus' words, This is my body, mean this is my body. In fact, he took a piece of chalk and wrote the words, This is my body, on the table itself. Hach et corpus meum. Whenever Zwingli or the other Swiss reformers tried to disagree with Luther about the reality of these words, Luther would lift the tablecloth and point to the words. The Marburg Articles therefore indicate we are not agreed as to whether the true body and blood of Christ are bodily present in the bread and wine. The Marburg Articles, along with the Schwabach Articles, provided a firm foundation for writing of the Augsburg Confession. The 17 Schwabach Articles were first presented on October 16, 1529. They insisted on unity and doctrine as a prerequisite for any cooperation among the various Protestant groups in Germany. Charles V persisted with his efforts to eliminate the religious controversies in his territories. He was facing pressure from the threat of a Turkish invasion from the east. He was also mindful that the Pope might, at any time, strike an alliance with the ruler of France and attack his empire from the west. The empire was a coalition of relatively independent territories and free cities. The key rulers of the empire were known as electors, for they actually elected the emperor. Charles depended on them both militarily and politically. He could not afford to alienate them. Charles was very devout and felt strongly that it was his duty to protect the Roman Church from the threat posed by the Lutherans and the other Protestant reformers. He hoped that the meeting at Augsburg would settle all disputes. The elector of Saxony, John the Steadfast, at first refused to attend the meeting in Augsburg, but Charles urged him to do so. Since Charles invited everyone attending to share their opinions, thoughts, and notions, Elector John asked the Wittenberg theologians, led by Martin Luther, to prepare a statement of confession. Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, Justice Jonas, and John Bugenhagen met in Torgau and went to work immediately. Their document was given to Elector John at the Torgau Castle in March of 1530, and is therefore known as the Torgau Articles. On April 4th, Elector John left Torgau with Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, Justice Jonas, and Veit Dietrich, a secretary to Luther. Ten days later, on Good Friday, they arrived at Coburg Castle. Luther and the Elector remained at Coburg, while the others traveled on to Augsburg. There, Philip Melanchthon was given the responsibility of leading the Lutheran theologians. However, the Elector had set up a special courier service to make sure letters between Luther and his colleagues would be sent and received quickly. Elector John arrived in Augsburg on May 2nd. The meeting began with a clear signal that the courageous Lutheran laymen were not about to concede to the emperor's demands, nor compromise their convictions. As Charles' royal procession approached at Augsburg, it was met by a large delegation from the city, including the Lutheran princes. The Pope's ambassadors stood to give the whole assembly a special blessing from the Pope. 
When the crowd knelt, Elector John and his fellow, fellow Lutheran princes refused to kneel. Charles and those with him made their way into the city and arrived at the cathedral, where a special mass was held. The crowd noticed that again Elector John and Philip of Hesse refused to kneel and remained standing, with their heads covered during the blessing. Later that evening, Charles and his brother Ferdinand, the King of Austria, met privately with the Lutheran princes. They ordered them to forbid any Lutheran preaching in Augsburg during the meeting. They commended, commanded them to attend the Corpus Christi festival the next day with the Emperor. George Margrave of Brandenburg spoke boldly for the Lutherans. He refused to concede to Charles' demand, saying, Before I let anyone take from me the word of God, and ask me to deny my God, I will kneel and let him strike off my head. The emperor, clearly taken aback by George's boldness, sputtered in broken German, Not cut off head, dear prince, not cut off head. The plan to present the Torgau articles had to be scrapped when it was found out that a lengthy, slanderous attack on Luther had been prepared by John Eck, Luther's old nemesis. At Leipzig in 1519, it was Eck who had tried to brand Luther as a heretic. Now he had secretly written a lengthy attack on Luther and his followers in a book titled 404 Articles for the Diet in Augsburg. It included quotations from Martin Luther's writings, as well as from other Protestant reformers. And it should be pointed out the quotes were all taken out of context. The book was highly inaccurate and tried to equate the Lutherans with the teachings of Ulrich Zwingli and the most radical of all the reformers, known as the Anabaptists. Uh, the Anabaptists, Anabaptists means rebaptize. Uh, their descendants uh, today are actually the Amish. X goal was to identify Lutheranism with the most extreme reformers, some of whom denied the most basic doctrines of historic Christianity. In light of this development, the Lutherans were forced to prepare a new statement of faith and specifically distance themselves from Zwinglians, Anabaptists, and others. The Augsburg Confession was intentionally crafted to present a gentle and peaceful response to the emperor. It was intended only to speak for Saxony. However, as various German leaders read it, they indicated that they too wanted to sign their names and make it their confession. So on June 25, 1530, Courageous Lutheran laymen confessed their faith and told the emperor and the Roman church what they believed, taught, and confessed. They relied on the promise of God's word, as contained in Psalm 119.46. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings, and shall not be put to shame. The Augsburg Confession was presented as a statement of biblical truth and a proposal for true unity in the Christian faith. It has never been withdrawn. The translation that we'll be reading is from the 1584 Latin edition of the Book of Concord, which was the base text for the Augsburg Confession in the Concordia Triglata, which is a book that has the German, Latin, and English translations. And tomorrow night we will begin listening to the Augsburg Confession. The first few articles will go quickly uh, because they're not disputed. They're basic, basic stuff. Uh, until we get to justification, uh, which actually is also quite brief. It's only three uh, short sentences, uh, even though that is the big difference between them and Rome, but it's very simple to state. So the first few articles will go quickly, and they will get longer and longer as they get more and more uh, against what Rome was actually teaching. I have to sign in, sorry. Okay. So we will begin that tomorrow night. And uh, just as a little bit of trivia, uh, when our pastors uh, take their ordination vows and we vow to uh, use the Book of Concord because it is a perfect and true exposition of what the Bible says, uh, we are not uh, taking our vows to the English translation. We are actually taking our vows to the 1580 Latin and the 1584, or I'm sorry, the 1580 German and 1584 Latin books of copies of the Augsburg Confession. So if you look at our books, we have a translation in English from the both the German and the Latin text. It's kind of neat because uh, between the two languages, you can actually pick up some, some subtleties. 
that you don't have to concern yourself with, but, it, but it's interesting. We now join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise your fathomless mercy, with which you take pity on sinful men. All the prophets and apostles preach this to us in your holy word. Let our hope not be put to shame when we pray for you for all who suffer at this time. For behold, the evil foe has become mighty, and the great ones of this world rule often with unrighteousness. O God, who in former times caused your saints to overcome injustice, strengthen also today all who stand in need of your help. Grant that all prisoners of war held as slaves in sacrifices of earthly wrath may return to their home. Stand by all refugees and homeless people and be their justice. Be a father to the widows and orphans with your strong protection. Go through the bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us through their example and the example of so many holy martyrs to be ever watchful of the confession of your Son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand upon us. But if it is your will that we be persecuted for confessing Jesus as our Lord and only Savior, then support us in your grace that we may withstand all trials and grant us peaceful rest. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, through the prophet Ezekiel, you continued the prophetic pattern of teaching your people the true faith and demonstrating through miracles your presence in creation to heal it of its brokenness. Grant that your church may see in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the final end times prophet, whose teachings and miracles continue in your church through the healing medicine of the gospel and the sacraments. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.